So hi everyone, welcome to Outgrow's Marketer of the Month. I'm your host Saksham Sharda. I'm the creative director at Outgrow, and I have with me here my co-host Anushka Chopra, who's the social media and outreach analyst at Outgrow. And for this month, we are going to interview Yepe Kurt Bond, who is the most followed investor on eToro. So Yepe, we're going to start with a rapid fire round just to break the ice. Try to keep your answers to one word or one sentence only. and anushka is going to start with the first question all right all right so, yeah um so the first question is texting or talking talking <laughs> uh, okay. how long does it take you to get ready in the morning zero minutes <laughs> you just get up and you open your laptop exactly <laughs> all right also, yeah all right so instagram or facebook Say that again. Do you prefer Instagram or Facebook? Instagram. Okay. Nickname okay. your parents used to call you. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, books or movies? Books. Last song you downloaded? The Strokes, Electricity Scape. Huh. Okay. Um. a digital watch or an analog watch which one do you prefer analog okay i prefer digital but okay how many tabs do you have open on your browser on an average uh, so right now i have open about 22 and that looks low <laughs> so but not much more i think when i when i reach 30 i always sort of evaluate <laughs> your life decisions <laughs> you start evaluating yeah. your life decisions <laughs> All right. Okay, um at what age do you want to retire? Uh 50. Mm-hmm. Okay. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Two two uh, caffeinated and two decaffeinated. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh what's something you could eat for a week straight? Sushi. Mm-hmm. Have done that. Have done that many times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fill in the blank. I can survive on dash hours of sleep. Three. <laughs> yeah, from what I know right. in Amsterdam. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Okay, so that's the end of the rapid fire round. Uh, yeah. Let's move on to the bigger questions. Anushka, you want to ask the first one? Yep. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to happy to do that. Okay. So yep. Yeah, um. from a consulting manager to an investor how has the ride been so far and i'd also love to know why you started investing in the first place yes so i think it's been a it's been very a smooth uh, transition and there's been an extremely good overlap between the skill sets needed to invest well and also to advise management on how to run their companies essentially when companies get big enough everything is about strategy and investments at at that level because you need to choose how much you're going to pour into something or something else and how to sort of um yeah, so there's a lot of overlap between what you need as a as a strategy consultant and what you need as an investor i originally started because i started making money and um i i had excess capital every month and i wanted to to invest it then of course i had the option to uh, to use my normal pension fund but then i i learned that uh, you know my options for our company program was they would put uh, 75% maximum in stocks and it would only be in big danish stocks um so like i can definitely do better than that um then uh, then i just went for it on my own and then then i started um doing quite well and then then it 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 went better and better and better and then uh, yeah, then I just uh, never never stopped with that and then eventually of course as I was doing so well more people on eToro started to copy me and then in the beginning I just thought ah oh, it's funny you know now I just made $300 from people copying me and I made you know $500 from my investments and whatnot and then it just kept growing until eventually I was making a lot more money from this than from my my actual uh, advisory role as a consultant and then I decided to focus only on the on the investment side of it. Mhm. Okay. And do you think a lot of consulting managers are in the investing business now on eToro for instance? 
I know that um, there was uh, um, there was at one time another uh, uh, management consultant as well who was uh, one of the, the top investors. So there's at least been been two of us on eToro like that. But otherwise, I see people coming from many many different places. Um, but it's 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 one good avenue. But also, management consulting is a very big field. So I think um, I think in particular. If you come from from strategy consulting or something where you've worked a lot with valuation, it's it's a very big plus because I see a lot of, for instance, consultants that know a lot about IT and they understand that a certain um, new piece of software or a, a new sort of trend is going to change some things, but they are just not really capable of telling whether that business is also fairly valued. So is this great future already priced in? And without sort of that ability to just just analyze the financial statements and understand what's really being said between the lines of the you know the management and so forth, we, without that you you can't probably assess if it's also a good investment, even if you have the skills to understand that this is a great company. Mm -hmm. So what do you think like is the overlap between what you do and what venture ca capitalists do? like and what is the difference so i think there is um it's sort of there is a, a at the very lowest level from like um you know at at, at seed capital level and before it's it's uh there's, there's much less data to go on. There's a there's a lot more sort of I, I would expect that at that level you have to analyze 100 companies to find one good one as you mm -hmm. get a little bit 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 um Bit uh, further down the line, there's more information available. There's there's have been more selection process, but of course, then you know you, if you do pick up a company at the very very early stage, you have a much longer longer runway to really make a a, a, a great amount of profits. So so I think there's some um, there there is some some similarities, especially if you are looking at growth companies. Then then it'll it'll be more similar, and I think also we are seeing many companies now IPO earlier, which means they have more in common with private equity and with uh, venture capital than they actually do with um, with with large established um, stock companies because they're really still at the stage where the focus is entirely on growing revenue. You have companies that are being IPO that have you know in the past year increased their revenue by a hundred percent. So that that's you know numbers, and and you know without being anywhere close to profitability, they might be you know having a 50% loss in the past mm -hmm. year. So that is much more similar to a, to a startup than it is to a, a, a mature century old uh, high profit business. Mm -hmm. I completely understand. Cause you were talking about, yeah. oh yeah, <laughs> I don't know how, how much I'm like, okay, let's go. <laughs> Anushka, you were saying something? No, that's all right. Please continue. I was gonna say, what do you think about Uber? Um, I think I use Uber a lot. I was uh, I've just been in Russia and use uh, Yandex as well. And I think here in London we have something called uh, Via Van. So so everywhere there are some small competitors now. Uber is uh, is uh, working with Yandex. No, I mean and, for instance about the Uber's IPO because like I'm building it from there. So yeah, so so I'm just saying in general. In general, I really really think it's it's nice that you're able to get movement around like this. But I think besides the person transport, there's a really great opportunity for uh, goods transportation. So we're starting here with the Uber Eats getting getting a pizza mm. delivery and whatnot. But there is this this whole sort of um, um, delivery to your home uh, business that's that's being built. It's currently being competed by between you know post offices and Amazon going into it on their own and and Uber mm. and, and 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 other delivery companies. But essentially, we are we are fighting the big war now for how to get everything in your home delivered really easily and having maybe only one or a few really well organized companies that will come to your home anyway multiple times per day so when they're already coming to deliver a pizza that's a time they might as well also be bringing that thing that you bought and so forth and i think uber actually has a shot at that which makes them more valuable however in the person transportation side in general when you're building a business that has where you have to build both sides of the market it's very difficult so in this case you're trying to make drivers meet riders that's difficult because you need to build both sides of the business. It's easier if you just have to sell a product and find buyers than to have to find uh, sellers and buyers. But once you get to the stage of the self-driving car, could be in 25 years or 40 years, then at that stage, you eliminate one side of the market. You no longer need to find the drivers. So then all the hard work to build both sides of the market won't be worth as much. And then it's a, it's a question of whether the 
things that are considered very difficult now, like like building an, a, a good app like Uber has, if that's really difficult enough that others won't be able to 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 steal a large share and drive down the profitability. That's what I'm afraid of, and that's why I'm not invested in Uber at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask the next question now. Uh, so you have a background in strategic planning. How important do you think it is for a company to make data-driven decisions? I think it's very important to look at data and make data-driven decisions, but I think there is a, um, you have to uh, also uh, apply common sense to the data. There's a lot of people who, 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 um, who, do simple regressions on past data, but then they miss sort of like the the, the big point. Having twenty uh, points of, of data and in, in increasing the complexity of your model and and trying to use all the data in the organization, it can sound better, but it, it, in practice, it's, it's 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 it will give you worse decisions. If you can sort of on anything, it's even if you're valuing a company, you're valuing whether a product will be successful or so forth. If you just get like the four or five most important things right. Then that that's more than enough. So you don't have to sort of like get every single little little piece of, of data. And in a world where you have a very very high availability of data, you can sort of succumb to that mistake of then then spending uh, spending not even just time, but actually spending part of your model on, on on certain small pieces of data that should just just be ignored. So it's more a key of finding out like which which uh, five or six things are actually really important and will 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 drive my decision on this. And then being able mm -hmm. to deselect what you think, what you can work and you can choose to ignore. Okay, yeah, okay, that completely makes sense. Anushka, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, number three. Um, yep. Yeah. So, say someone has to invest in a small business. What are your thoughts about that particular market? For investing in small businesses? Yep. I think it's. I mean, it's a. Uh, it's if, if you can find the right ones, it's great. I mean, uh, the 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 only issue there is, of course, that that you just uh, whenever you attend these uh, these um, events to 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 meet many different startups and so forth, they are, mm -hmm. uh, the the best ones also now have have a have a, a, an idea that they are worth a lot. So they are you know they they they've come up with a with a very very high valuation, which makes you not want to invest. And uh, yeah, so so that that's been my experience, unfortunately. Um, but but uh, yeah, of course, if, if you can, uh, you always need sort of like a, in order to that's the same for stocks. In order to find great companies, you there's there's no sort of like a easy way to do it. If you if you take if you take a big data set of all the companies and then you try to sort for them, for sure the ones that you will find based on whatever model you use, there will be something else wrong with them, which is the reason they show up where they will in the model. So you need always to have some, you know, if you have the right person that gives you the right tip at the right time, or you have the right um, sort of like a hop of people meeting in a certain place and that can you need something something like that that can give you the um, the way into to to a, a company and an idea that 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 for some reason has escaped larger investors. Okay, so what are some things that you look out for before actually investing in a company or in bonds, for example? So I um, I analyze them very carefully. So I look at all the financial statements. I listen to all the conference calls and hear what the what various uh, interviews I can get with the CEOs. I like to talk to people who work in the business. I can view, you know, people's LinkedIn profiles, what they say about working in the business. There's a lot of stuff available online just from reading the product reviews, seeing, you know, what 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 do I think about the latest products? Oftentimes, I buy various products, and like right now, I have my my uh, my Google Home and my Alexa in the house, so I sort of compete mm. them against each other to see which one I like more. Mm. And you know, with with, with all of those things, you sort of if, if if when you if you start out with a blank sheet, you know nothing about a company. Then in the beginning, you're just learning new and learning new and learning new. And then after a while, you start to be like, right, yeah, I know that. Yeah, right, I know that. And th at that point, you know, like, okay, fine, I'm not getting a lot of uh, new stuff now. I can feel feel confident that uh, if there was some other big thing out there, you know, then uh, that I wouldn't be discovering, then more research now won't make me discover it. So I, I can uh, can can be clear in my assessment here. And then then. You know, I, I I have my yeah. my financial models, and then I I based on what I have then found, I give what I think is the the fair price, and then if that fair price is significantly um, higher than what the market is actually trading at, then then I'll make an investment. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go for the next question. So yeah, tell please. me something most investors think is true, 
that you think is bullshit or something that you think that uh, is true and most investors think is bullshit? <laughs> Um, well, I think one thing that everybody's getting wrong, including top economists and central banks, is that they are they are looking at inflation instead of seniorage when calculating your real return on capital. It's sort of like a, a it's a little bit complex, but essentially, if you have an economy that's growing at two percent, two percent more people, two percent more goods, two percent more transactions, two percent more of everything, and there's also two percent more money then you will see inflation at 0%. But your real return is actually, you've lost the 2% of the extra money that was created unless that went proportionally directly to you, which it probably didn't. So when you see an inflation rate of like 2%, but it's in a growing economy, your actual net loss on having just kept currency is even higher than that. And so I think that leads more people to keep more money in currencies than is actually, um, yeah, in, than you would really want to do. And uh, yeah, that, that's that's a common mistake. I mean, obviously, there's lots of other people who this is at a second level. There's a lot of people who just get inflation wrong, basically. So when they are talking about how much something has grown, they are forgetting about inflation. Or if they're talking about, um, yeah, how much they're they're calculating, they're they're gaining per year, they they're forgetting the inflation bit. So it just distorts the whole sort of like view of how things are actually growing. Mm -hmm. And what what do you what is something that you think is true that most people think is bullshit? The other way around. So if you flip the coin, <laughs> I think blockchain is a um, is a very bad technology. I don't think it's. I think it's for any given project, it's extremely unlikely. Blockchain is the best um, technology you would use for that. I'm very happy mm -hmm. to see Libra coin is basically not using blockchain. They're using mm -hmm. it in sort of name only. And I think that you can maybe get around it by calling it crypto or, or, or sort of changing the definition a bit. But blockchain has become this big brand where people think, oh, it's great because of decentralization. But it, if you really think about it, when you have a lot of buyers, a lot of sellers, for instance, it could be for... Uh, for goods so you, then you have all the buyers and sellers meeting on amazon or it could be for like a terminal port so you have all the ships that need to meet the different cranes in the terminal and so forth then you 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 would you don't not you do not want decentralization you want a nice central uh, entity where all the buyers and the sellers meet and you do not necessarily want everybody to have a vote on how to change that central system it's quite fine and so this whole thing with like cutting out the middleman that you're not really cutting out the middleman you're often creating a central middleman and if you want decentralized control over that central middleman you can just have that you, you know if, if eight uh, shipping companies wanna decentrally control their own um, like portal for for managing um, how a cranes meet ships then they can just have that as a joint venture where they each own one eighth of the of the joint venture and then vote like that then you don't even need blockchain in that case so even like so you don't usually need the decentral model and even when you do then you don't need blockchain for it so i think bitcoin is incredibly successful despite being on blockchain it would be better if it was not on blockchain unfortunately it is on blockchain but because it's the first big private currency and private currencies are awesome then it's really good now if someone can go out and make an asset-backed private currency that's not based on blockchain then i think it has even greater hopes mm -hmm. and so you think libra will do pretty well i don't know i think they can uh, they, they can um i think they are getting a tougher eye from regulators because it, it mm -hmm. does seem more serious and because, you know, yeah. So, so, so with any of these projects here, it's more likely it will not succeed than that it will succeed, but that's still fine. You know, you can manage those, those probabilities. It's being, being good at investing is not about being right more than like 50% of the time. It's as, as Jeff Bezos says, we take a lot of bets where we are, you know, nine out of 10 will fail, but the one that succeeds gives you back at times a hundred. So you have to be, you know, willing to take those as well. And of course it, it can, it, it can, from a, a marketing perspective, that's always tough because, you know, you do a project and it has a high likelihood of failing and then it fails. And then everybody comes like, look, you know, you failed, you, 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 you invested in this thing or you, um, you worked on this project and, and it failed, but that, that's the that's just the nature. That's the nature of of uh, consulting projects, of startups, of businesses undertaking new initiatives. Anything that does something new like that has a quite high likelihood of failure. But if the um, potential return from it succeeding are high enough, then you know you just have to do those things over and over and over again, and then in the end you will you know you'll have a a, a quite good return as a company and as an investor. Mm -hmm. So how many like because. Uh, 
you've spread your eToro portfolio amongst like many companies, right? So how many of them, like, because a lot of companies are getting into blockchain. What do you have to think about that? Because, uh, you know, they've started using it for random stuff. So what do you have to think about that? Well, so I think that uh, many of many of the, um, the consulting firms know that blockchain is useless and they are still sort of like, some have now taken it off their website. So they're, they're trying to sort of like backtrack a little and be, be not mm -hmm. a... But there are others that are still saying, no, you know, it could potentially have some uses. We're just not there yet. Or, and then there are many, many of the largest companies, they have made blockchain projects and then they realize that it is not the best technology for the specific thing they're doing. And then it's just sort of quietly being phased out or they're mm -hmm. still touting it as this will be something big. I mean, you have and you have other companies that, that are just, you know, they, they just put down $10 million to do a blockchain project to be able to do a big press story. And that, that press story has already generated more sort of like branding awareness to pay for that project so the project doesn't have to to do anything um it, it, it's just sort of like because there's this big attention mm -hmm. to blockchain then then it can be used as a way and also if you're doing a if you're doing a project and you add the word blockchain it might get more like attention mm -hmm. and so 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 for the so until sort of people come to terms with with the fact that it's not a, a um you know the the technology of choice for most projects but for like you know 99.99 percent of projects then then it, you know, it can continue to have a strong brain and people will think that it's interesting and new, but sometimes, you know, it's, um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think that's the case. And so I'm not investing in a, in, a, in tons of uh, small, small blockchain based startups. And if there was a big company that I had that was actually doing something more than just in name, you know, then, then, then maybe I would look to get out of those and be like, right, they are betting on the wrong horse here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'll just, uh, I'll ask the next question. Um, yeah, but can you walk us through your investing process? Because I mean, you're clearly very good at it, and I'm sure our listeners would love to know what are the steps that you follow. Yeah, so first, I need to get ideas for stocks to consider, and mm -hmm. I, 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 I myself start from the very top. So I analyze how do I think the world economy is going, the different regions and industries, what what are what is their um, growth expected to be. Then I look down saying, okay, within specific industries and in specific countries, um, which ones do I believe more in? Which mega trends do I, do I think are, are more interesting? Then I compare different companies that are riding those mega trends or in those industries, and I compare them. You know, how how is their how how are their products in comparison to each other? How how is their profitability? What are their growth prospects? Do I like the management? What are people saying? What are people who work in the company saying and so forth? And then based on that, I find you know maybe one company or two companies in that industry that I want to pick. And but then 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 sort of that that that's the sort of big top down approach. But I also get a lot of tips both because I have you know. Uh, so many, uh, I have 80,000 followers and 6,000 copiers on eToro. So they write me lots of ideas. And whenever I'm out talking to people and just, you know, living my life, buying new things and, and checking new things out, then, then, then there's, you know, companies come to mind and then, then I uh, research them as, as a potential investment. And then quite often what happens is I don't invest in that particular company or that idea someone told me, but maybe they have a supplier, maybe they have a competitor, maybe, you know, from that springs another idea. I tried mm -hmm. also, you know, the other methods I, I, I used the stock screen. It's just look at every single stock in the world. Let's look at all of the, you know, financial metrics for them and rank them in a weighted manner to get which ones should be most interesting, but doing it in that sort of like a big scale way, in my experience doesn't work all the ones that come up on top they look good then based on that particular model you used but then when you analyze them in detail you find there's something else wrong like yeah this company has their stock cost nothing and they are massively profitable but then you find out actually there's a lawsuit and this this is gonna ruin them or something like that so it's mm -hmm. uh so as you sort of i think again you it's you have to find these sort of uh little sneaky ways in where an idea or hypothesis somehow gives you something that's that that's not 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 properly seen in the market i was gonna say uh you think something yeah i mean i was just really curious to know what according to yep it was his best and worst investment i mean or maybe a missed potential opportunity that you just thought of in hindsight and you were like oh i wish i'd invested in that Yes, yeah, so the, um, the the best ones have been um, been some of the uh, big tech companies like Amazon and and Facebook and Apple and, and these companies. Uh, the worst ones have been general my my investments in Chinese companies. Some of them have done relatively well compared to 
uh, Chinese companies, but but overall, I've uh, I've uh, I've lost money on my investments in Chinese companies, and um, the, the the ones that are sort of like that I regret are, are the ones that I came very close to. You know, I valued them to be very good investments, but not good enough that I would that they were you know better than my other investments. So I always I have all my investments ranked, and the ones at the bottom are always, of course, at risk of being replaced by something that's almost good enough to invest in. And so some of the ones that like Beyond Meat came very close there, and so that was you know you no know, uh, sad that that didn't just make make it in. But you know that that's a uh, it, it it it's not that big a deal. There's you know there's there's thousands of companies that will do well, and and it it's. Uh, you know, as Warren Buffett says, you don't need to, you know, he, he's done it very extremely. So, you know, you don't need to make a, a thousand good investments. You just need to do like, you just pick up like 10 great companies over your investing career that, that, that can be, be more than enough. Mm. Yeah. I was going to say, because what you had mentioned to me that uh, when you invest like or like in, on eToro, when people invest in general, they do, they have like a range of companies they're investing in. So one shouldn't be looking at, you know, short term returns, but there can actually be a stable long term return. So you were talking about something that you want to elaborate on that. Yeah. So I, I mean, I always say that you should have at least a five year horizon for your investments. Mm -hmm. um, it's like time in the market beats timing the market. And I, I, I you know, I, I ideally think people should think, think in decades, not in years. But of course, there are others that think just month. What will be my return in one month? It's like that that, that should not not really, you know, uh, come into your mind. You should be thinking much much more long term. And there, in general, I mean, stocks have been on average going up by seven percent per year for whichever long period you want to think about it, whether you think for hundred years or maybe eight hundred years. So, there in any given year, it can double or half. It might in any given month go up or down by 10%. But sort of the long steady trend is that that average is out over a long period of time. So you can be unlucky, you start investing, and then it goes down just as you had started. And then you might be discouraged for life. And others, they get started, and then you know they have a good experience in the beginning, and then they are luckily then you know in it for life. But it shouldn't be sort of like that that determines that you should really just look at history and be like, right, setting aside capital to invest in markets is in the long term a really, really good idea in general. And then how you want to do it specifically, if if you don't know anything about investments, then you know you you probably want to have a just get the market average. So that you know just use ETFs or whatever to just say I just want to have the average. I cannot do any better. And of course if you if you if you think you can do better than the market or you know you have you have time and can do it then you can start to say, actually, you know, I'm not, not just going to have every single telecom. I'm going to pick the one that I really like. I'm not going to have every thing. I'm going to going to pick the ones that I really think will will beat the average. And then, then, then you know, mm. and then you can do better. But even still with that, you can still, you can, you can, you can reduce your risk a lot using diversification. So that means you have stocks from different regions, from different industries of different sizes that are different maturity stages that are different stages of the value chain. So if you, if you, if you diversify all those things, you, you do not need to have, you know, 10,000 companies to be well diversified. Mathematically, when you go from one investment to 10, you will say, if you only have one investment, that's probably the company that you think is is the most undervalued, the really good one. But then you have no diversification whatsoever. When you go down to 10 companies from different regions and industries, now you actually have a lot of diversification and you haven't you know, put in too much trash in the portfolio. But when you go down to have 10,000 different stocks, you're not actually getting that much more diversification. It's sort of like a, it, um, it, it tapers off. So you know, if you have probably something like 20 to 40, 40 stocks that are correctly picked, that, that'll give you sufficient diversification. But it, of course, it depends that if you have only 20 stocks and they're all American tech stocks, then they're likely to, uh, to, uh, to, to give you more wild swings together. So one could technically arrive at a particular average number per year for an increase for a diversified stock, right? There must be a particular number because you're saying yearly it tends to like do better or like you're saying per decade you should be looking at it in a decade right that's what you're saying so so it, it averages out over a long time it'll definitely not mm. average out in any one year the stock markets mm. overall have historically been able to double a half 
So that that you know, mm. so if you're unlucky, you come. But even then, even then, if you had invested right before the last financial crisis of 2008, like you just came in right then, and then immediately you lost mm. 60%, you would be like, mm. you know, or you know, immediately lost 50%. But then, if you um, had just you know, you'd done that at the start <laughs> of this year, you would have still have been up by 60% in total. So that's sort ah. of that, that, and so that, that's sort of like yeah, you you might it, it, and technically over a decade, if if your stocks doubled, then half, then doubled, then half, and then you know plus mm-hmm. minus, then and then at the end you had you can see right, I made on average seven percent per year, you know mm-hmm. that that's the that's that's, that's the, then the total thing that matters. It's not not necessarily that, and also sometimes you know the the short short movements are really sort of if if the stocks if they raise the interest rate and that causes stocks to be valued lower i'm like yeah but that's because they're now measured in higher value currency and we also have a more uh, safe um sort of uh, financial system as a result Mm -hmm. so you're sort of okay fine i'm losing some here but i'm gaining something here so if you if you're just only looking at like a like a oh it fell fell by ten percent ah it it went up by ten percent as a lot of a short term thing then then you know you, you won't be able to to um yeah to to find the, the best investment opportunities you have, you have to sort of mm. a, a movement on its own doesn't tell you anything essentially it's the, how does that move compare with how the world looks now because mm, I, was, I was just wondering because at here at outgrow we tend to make return of investment calculators so i'm just thinking does etoro have those like does etoro show you your return of investment over a year or over 10 years yeah yeah it has all the all the, all the data so you can you can uh, you can export every mm. single little piece of data but it also shows some nice dashboards so you can go in and see like what has your return been each month what has your return been each year what has been the return on the different investments and so forth you can also see so like if how it was presented infographically it would like have a deeper impression on people because i think if you just see it in like short bits or like short term then you're less convinced than if you could actually see it in a long term graphic way as to like the way you just explained to me if i'd gotten in just before the recession and stayed until today, I would still be 60% up, right? Exactly. That's one good thing. Another mm. one thing to have in mind is stocks. Now, I, I personally, since I started investing, I've made 33% per year on average. Mm. So that means doubling the value uh, quicker than every three years. If you look at the market average growing at 7% per year in real return, that means doubling the value of your portfolio every decade. But if you double every decade, that means that after two decades, you know, 20 years, you have four times. But after three decades, you have eight times. After four decades, you have 16 times. So it sort of means actually from a small a few years of, of good investment, you can, and that, that you know, you can at the, uh, without, you know, removing inflation from it, you can after four decades have 16 times that. So you can really sort of like, in that sense, build a, build a fortune in, in the long run through investing. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, Anushka, you want to ask the next question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, but like, I mean, you're the most popular investor on eToro, right? So does having a large group of people following your investments change your strategies at all? No, I've I've had some people who've been telling me here, they're like, you know, you should sell this one or you should that. And then, then you know, uh, the, the first time I almost did it, then I was like, you know what? No, if I start to sort of like... Uh, invested in a different way than I would invest it myself, then then mm. it, it, it it's yeah, know, it sort of defeats the purpose. I have also purposely not so I, I, I also copy myself so that I, this is how I invest all my money. I wouldn't want to have a an, another account with a different set of investments because then it again removes the idea that I invest my money and if you copy me, you are, you know, um we are in the same boat. It's thing like, you know, mm. you should as a cook, you should eat your own cooking. And I think you know you can mm-hmm. have some big banks where they are advising their customer to invest in one way, and then they are themselves investing in the complete opposite way. And now you might say like you know, but every person is different, so they should give differentiated investment advice. And that's also correct, but there's also some value to the idea that I invest in the way that I personally think I can get the best return for me at a certain risk profile. I don't take zero risk. I take some risk, knowing that I think this risk is worth it in terms of how much return I can get. And then a lot of other people who you know, who come from different different needs and different profiles, I'll explain them, you know, you need to think long term is risky, capital's at risk and so forth. But also this, you know, the, you are you're in the same boat as me. I'm not not doing a, 
you know, I'm not 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 investing in it in a different way, and then trying to sort of like sell you this thing. This is like this is what I invest in with my money to make the highest return for me, and you can copy that. So, what do you rely on more, your gut feeling or research? No, like it's before. definitely it's definitely research. I think okay. gut feeling can uh, can matter in terms of the exact decision time. But I, I always sort of like if I have anything, any any information or insight, or if even if it was gut feeling, then that I put that into an Excel model, and then I adjust my weights in there, and then based on that I make a decision. <laughs> and that's the same approach that I used as a management consultant when we were deciding um, or helping companies decide on major projects. We'd say what are all the important factors? How important is each of those factors? We score them within those things, and then out comes a result. And then, then, then you know, even even if there's some subjectivity to it, which that that definitely is, it's you know, it's mainly subjective. You still have that very clear approach where you're very conscious of why you're deciding something. And if you later on think that you know your decision was wrong, you can see very clearly what was wrong. Right, right. We've assigned a lot of importance to this thing, and actually that turned out to not be important at all. And in the, when I bought my my uh, my apartment, I did the same thing. I made an Excel file. I put in a lot of different flats I had looked at, and I scored them on you know the price and the location and how many rooms they had and so forth. And then then I just sort of ranked them, and then I bought the, the one that came in number one. And that's how I do it with investments as well. But if there's if I look at all the the, the sort of like um, say that I've uh, looked at it through the day and at the end I'm like, I'm feeling pretty sure, you know, I should be, uh, I, sh I should sell this one now or I should be investing in this one. You know, mm -hmm. gut feeling might determine if I then just go ahead, right. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and buy now or I might decide like, you know what, let me just sleep on it and, and review it again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's that's the sort of, that can be the, at the end of the day, do I do it now or do I just sleep on it? That's a gut feeling okay. decision. So well, basically, like... yeah, go, go ahead. ahead Sasha, Sounds, you must have a lot of Excels. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm always looking for other tools to, uh, I'm, I'm always doing like, I, I look like, because, because I, I like the research process, so I always try to use many different tools and just explore new tools and so forth. But I sort of always come back to this one again, because I, it's, it's very flexible. You quickly want to, want to, want to change something. And that's also what you see sort of like when you are advising a, a, a large bank, you, you sort of always start out with anything new in Excel and then the model changes and you, you, you do various bits and bobs and then, then only once a process has really stagnated and it's done in the same way year after year, then you transition over to if it's if it's really standardized to like S base or if it's if it's if there's still if it's the if if it's you know the data has just become too big but it's not being standardized yet maybe you'll use Python or something but it is it's the sort of that that transition before you go into this really locked down big uh, uh, cloud mm -hmm. model of some kind then then uh, then then you you are more uh, you 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 prefer the flexibility and then you just have to deal with the the sort of uh, very various i mean i i have my ideas for which tools would be superior and i'm really waiting for some of the big software providers to build me these tools and whenever i use a new tool i always get the disappointment of seeing like oh, i can't do this and i can't do that but yeah well, the tools are getting I'm better, and better. Fascinated how you're using it for your uh you know, professional life and private life while buying an apartment. <laughs> you also, and this is obviously stupid, yeah. but it would be nice to use it for a relationship, like, you know, to, <laughs> to see which factors matter the most and how, many, each, yeah. how much weight each carries. <laughs> yeah, so the extent that I use Excel decision-making is very, very far-reaching. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, should I ask the next question? I think you've already answered this question a bit, but if you want to add something, uh, the question is, how do you gather intelligence before investing? Some websites, sources of information, Yes, so um, there, of course, um, investing in big stocks, there is the, the big benefit that, that data has to be public. So you, um, so you have all the publicly available data available very easily, but it can be structured in different ways. There are many different websites that provide the data to you, like Yahoo Finance and Reuters and Morningstar and so forth. Unfortunately, quite often they actually make mistakes so they, they they put in the data in a wrong way or they, they ignore a bit sometimes they even get the currencies wrong so this is this is uh, actually a little bit silly i don't know why that has to be 
this um this bad but it, it just it just is and so there you are you know but there you can sort of you can trust it to a certain extent but then other times you have to go in and read the actual financial statement and find what is act, what what is what is you know how do i actually evaluate this this year also we, with different industries are different and even though you know financial standards are standardized they that that some some things that you would consider in one way in one industry but in a different way in a different industry just just because because you know how they are sort of what lies behind the the accounting then you have a lot of um, sort of all companies have a major presence online so the online is a, is a great great way you you can from from how their products are available in different countries and different sites what what people are saying about those products how their social media appearances what the ceo sounds like in some some youtube uh, interview and then you can combine that with of course what you see in the real world so meeting people from the companies what are they saying about it how do how do they like the, the atmosphere in the company is there you know, what is their excitement about now what is their sort of disappointment in and who are, who, are they, who are they afraid of in terms of competition and so forth? So, so, so with all of that, you, you you have a you know vast vast amount of data. But it's not it's, it's sort of like a, I I usually as a rule of thumb like you can get through it in six weeks. And that was also what I was trained to do as a consultant. You know, you come into a new business, you don't know this uh, this business as well as the people who've been there for twenty years. Yet after you know you, you come with other skills that they are lacking as well. But you know after six weeks, you should I ideally have the knowledge that they have about the business plus the additional stuff you have and that means you know really really quickly read everything you can really really quickly try to structure things in a, in a good way and and, and f- you know find out what matters in terms of this product find out what matters in terms of of of, of this industry and then 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 after a while you start you start to 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 have a sense that like actually now I, I, when I read something, I understand it. When there's, uh, when 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 someone says something, I I know I can start to see them being wrong, and that then then you know sort of like all right, I'm a, I, I feel like an insider now. I know it well, and I know it well enough that I feel confident that I could advise the management of this business. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do you want to ask the next one? Uh, yeah, I would just I say one more thing. I also yeah. I also use a lot the the websites of the largest investment banks and consulting firms. Yeah, I, th- I think they they provide excellent analysis. Also, some of the biggest inter- uh, like international financial uh, organizations they provide excellent uh, reports and data on how the economy is going, how they evaluate new technologies, sort of which mm-hmm. things they are advising companies to look more carefully at. That informs me mm-hmm. a lot as well. And this is all for free on their website. Yes, mostly. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, great. Okay. So wait one yeah, second, you... What are some of the yeah. paid paid sources that you use? Uh, I'm not going to say my, my paid, uh, pay list of sources. <laughs> okay. I have a couple and I'm very happy with them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All okay, right. Yeah, okay. So, Yafir, what do you do with all the money that you get from your investments? Do you splurge? Do you reinvest it? I, I reinvest more than 50%. So, I definitely have a high investment rate. Um, as I've been making more money my consumption has also gone up but I, I i i do reinvest most of it and i don't have any plan to sort of like uh, take out from what i've been investing so i i reinvest most of what i make and then then um, hopefully that will continue to to grow as well and and, uh, and uh, in the end have a, a, a sizable portfolio that i can then uh, hand over to my children if i ever get one or some uh, a noble cause one day. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's the aim, right? We all aspire to earn a lot of money at some point uh, pre-made, that is, by when can you become a millionaire? And we have so many people use it. And like, similarly, we have one, uh, how much do you need to retire? So, I mean, these questions, uh, yeah, that's kind of the aim, right? Um, well, I mean, it's it's always nice to to uh, to increase the the size of of one's portfolio, and yeah. I, I I think there's 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 no upper upper bound. I think what will what will cause me in the end to uh, to uh, sort of retire or something will not be that I've uh, made a certain amount. It will be that I've uh, I've been uh, that I'm I'm not ahead anymore. In the in the in the mm-hmm. past years and and now. I feel like I have a good edge, you know. When I when I hear people say things, I'm like, yeah, yeah, but you're forgetting this thing. Or I I, I feel like I'm, I'm ahead in in many areas, and this 
causes me to to see some good opportunities and make good investments. But eventually, I will reach a point I expect where I look mm-hmm. at a lot of stocks and I'm like, right, I think this stock is worth this much, and that's what the price is. And I look at another stock, and that's how much I think it's worth, and that's what the price is. At which point I'll realize, oh, I don't have any big edge over everybody anymore. So now I have to just accept mediocre results. And at that point, then you know, then then it's not worth to spend every uh, day all day on, on it because the, you have you can only do that if if you feel like you really have an edge. So I I hope that that uh, will last an, another uh, decade or two. But of course, there's a lot of other. Uh, young smart people that are working very hard and they'll be uh, be uh, you know trying trying to catch up as quickly as they can you're still thinking in decades <laughs> it was like one should think in decades like i hope it lasts yeah, another absolutely. decade <laughs> but yeah okay that's that's a good way to i'm like always it's good to know when it's time for one to get out of the game because i think that's the risk in investment right when some people mm. don't know when to get out at all so uh I- I mean, there's also the thing, the, the invest invest in what you know isn't completely true because obviously you cannot, everybody's mm-hmm. only an expert in one thing or so. so you, if you only invest in that, you have no diversification. I generally invest in things that either I know or I know someone who knows it really well. So with some mm-hmm. of my stocks that have more high, uh, you know, advanced science behind them, I, I can't, even if I sit down and read a lot of papers on it, I won't understand it well enough. So it's much better for me to have somewhere I can say, you know, so isn't it like this thing? Like, no, yeah, but where you're wrong is here and here and your way you should think about it is instead like this. And of course, you know, at different times, different things are really interesting to you and you get an insight on something and learn a lot about that. But that that changes over time as well. And even as you're, as the, the things you are personally interested about and the things you need change, that, that also changes what you might be, uh, be be getting some special insights into. And that's what, what can lead someone like, you know, Terry Smith and, and Warren Buffett to even at, a, at a, even at a higher age, they're still finding, you know, uh, great companies to invest in. And then, uh, then, then years later, like, oh, they did it again. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, because uh, obviously once in a while there comes up in a market, a company like, you know, Theranos, Do you know, Theranos. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so, and people fall for that. And why do you think that tends to happen? Because like the people did fall for it at such a huge scale, right? That entire scam that happened. So. Yeah, so many, many that? of the blockchain projects like Meta, for instance, like like that, right? And the other companies that are having high growth, but I don't expect they will ever be extremely profitable. So there's there's definitely ones that like that, that, you know, that you can already see are surprising some people. And you, you can always, I mean, if people are... are um, you you can tell when 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 you listen to what people say, you can you can you can hear whether what they say is logical or if there's some flaw in their logic, and uh, mm-hmm. o- often there there's flaw in people's logic. But then there's a question of sort of like size, like uh, um, if any sort of like small project or company is 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 overvalued and declines in value, that that doesn't you know do much. If if even if you were unlucky to have invested in that, that's only going to make up. In, in my case, I, I rarely invest more than like five percent of my portfolio in one stock. So that's not going to want to want to you know mm-hmm. what, what's going to what's going to change anything in in any given period of time. What what's going to what what can more change something is if you look historically, if there's for instance a country who's been lying about their debt levels and suddenly suddenly they you know mm-hmm. it, it turns out it's much much uh, worse than than was expected. That can cause that can cause a problem. If you have a, a whole industry where it was just you know it was just expected that uh, that there were so great prospects here, and then in a very short period of time, all hope for those prospects disappear. That can mm-hmm. then then be big enough to essentially the global economy is quite resilient. It can take some punches whenever you hear something in uh, measured in billions you can usually ignore it it has to be in trillions to be able to to sort of like knock it off course mm. and 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 so so it is not really enough that there is so like one 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 little uh, like a bad egg in one little company like that there has to be some more like a profound misunderstanding or a profound lie or, mm. or something like that 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 suddenly is is revealed and and then and then uh, then causes some of the bigger forces to come into play and then if it's and i evaluate all those things and rank them and then see is this big enough is this big enough you know if, if mm. this happens then are we talking a half trillion in damage fine the global economy will be fine if it's and then and then only once you're like okay now it's a couple of trillions they've raised the interest rate do we have enough resilience then to beat something like that then then only once like it's above a third and threshold you you 
you know, I I start to 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 look at it as something like, oh, I gotta keep an extra eye on this. I gotta start uh, worrying about that. Mm. But I mean, I think now we have quite good growth around the world. Inflation's quite low, and we have managed to increase the interest rate, which which pr- provides a, 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 actually I would say safer environment than a couple of years back. And uh, I mean, the the big risks that 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 uh, everyone's been talking about since Davos. Uh, are still Brexit and U.S.-China conflict and so forth, and and you know you you can keep an eye on those. But I think all the most likely outcomes of those things are below the threshold of what would really is like a send the the global economy tilting right now. So so sort of uh, I expect more that there must be some uh, some black swan. So I'm you know working hard to to see if I can uh, be the one to to spot that black swan. And then uh, yeah, mm, I was gonna say, well. Since you have to keep track of all this knowledge and always be like, you know, have an edge, always have an edge uh, in this, let's just say, market, have you ever tr- thought about doing a startup of your own? Because all of this knowledge might actually be helpful for a yeah, company. Yeah, right I, I thought about it a lot in, in a, in, in, in a, I, I am. Um... I, I, I got close a couple of times. I've had some ideas that I thought were good and so forth. And I think at the end, what made me not become an entrepreneur was I didn't like the uh, the uh, social environment there. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I, I felt much better in simply socially. I felt much better as a consultant than I did as an entrepreneur. Whenever I approached people um, from the mindset of an entrepreneur or met with other entrepreneurs there was this idea that like you are you haven't made it yet you're not you know uh, who are you why are you here you know, why do you think you're special this sort of like a little bit derogatory attitude but when you come in as a consultant it's like thank god you're here we've been looking for some people for so long and we have this big issue and you know we're just so happy you guys here now what do you want you can have anything you want you know just just let's just get this thing done it's really important for us and you just feel so appreciated so you like so you just you, you, so then you can talk about which 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 work is more inherently interesting and so forth but when you do some work that people really appreciate then then that's actually also that can give you a nice feeling and make you really enjoy the job and i really liked sort of like consulting set up so well in the terms that you know projects only last like three months so at the end of them you've done it you know you get some gratification like that they always give you like promotions and raises so it almost feels like a computer game <laughs> i think they've really just like managed to, to make that whole process that you feel really good about sprinting to achieve something working well with your team to get it done reaching those milestones so it's much more sort of like smooth like that and, and that that can create a, a, a nice atmosphere. And then then uh, you know then on top of that I've gotten the investment thing here. And then then uh, yeah then I think there's simply been no uh, been no time left to uh, to pursue other things. There are many things given given uh, given enough time. There are so many things I would like to do. And you know there's just uh, only only so much time. Mm, okay, Sanushka, you want to go ahead with the last question? Yeah. Okay. So what are some tips that you'd like to give novice investors or basically something that you wish people had told you when you started investing? Um, so it's, it's not something that I wish they had. That's very different uh, questions because for okay. uh, I, I, I already had my master's degree in finance and, and worked advising <laughs> companies on valuation. Right. So I knew, knew, uh, knew very, I, I, I did not start investing and then learn. I, I learned about investments and, and knew a lot about investment and then I started investing. So it's a, okay. it's a different approach. But what most people that don't know anything about investments should learn before they get started is firstly, if you have uh, if you have, if you have debt with an interest rate of more than five percent, maybe even four, I would generally say you should pay that off before you start investing in stocks and bonds. So so because just getting rid of that is actually sort of an investment as well because you're no longer paying those interest payments. Then historically. Um, stocks has been the best uh, investment followed by property which has been okay as well bonds has been okay but then uh, forex um, and and commodities has been quite bad so if you're buying your first house that can be quite good but also investing in stocks can be quite good and again as stocks have doubled in value every decade if you do think in terms of decades money that you do not need to spend right now is really well placed in the markets to you know build a fortune over time for yourself or for your your family and then i think you can you should definitely use a platform one of them the, the sort of like new smart platforms rather than your own bank when you're investing and you should think about the fees if you usually your own bank 
will um, have very high trading commissions and they might even have like an annual fixed fee and so forth. So it can be very, very expensive to trade through your own bank. And that's where some of the newer companies like eToro, the one that I use, and uh, Saxo Bank and Interactive Brokers and Robinhood, they've simply um, taken the price level far, far down compared to that. So you're getting, you know, you're buying a your stock for way cheaper. Now eToro, I, I back in that they also make an Excel sheet to see which platform to use. So I compared these ones on the pricing and I like the website, the mobile, and then then eToro came out as the best one. And that, then I picked that one. Now since then they've reduced the the fees for stocks to zero. So it doesn't cost, there's, there's just no fees for trading stocks. And that's what I primarily trade. So when you pick a platform like that, it's nice that you pick the one that's best, but it's also nice that you pick the one that is getting better over time so that you, you know, it's not like the other one gets a new feature and using that you don't have the feature. You know, the other one is lowering the price, but suddenly they raise your fees. That's not nice. You got to think it ahead and think like you're picking a platform where you think, wow, this is really cheap and great now. And you also think this platform will be better and better over time and that they will, you know, keep the prices at a low level or at least, you know, you know, stay competitive and so forth. Okay, so I think that's about it. That's all the questions. Uh, thanks for joining us, Yepe. Uh, it was a great yeah. chat with a lot of tips <laughs> and a lot of yeah, information. Yeah, definitely learned a lot. Yeah.